So, uh, welcome everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Good to see you, even though I don't see you. I know you're there. <laughs> I saw there was 14 people. <laughs> now I see there's 15, well, at least 15 computers, I guess. Um, so, I'll start with a prayer. And then we'll what did we sing? Yeah, I missed it. We did. Yes. We sang. All right. Father in heaven, I thank you for another Sabbath day. And I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather uh, with the saints in this neck of the woods, Lord. And I pray your blessing to them and me. And I do pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will guide my mind, uh, that I would have clarity and be able to present this, Lord, as you would have me present it, Lord. So we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for all your blessings. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> so today, um, I've chosen a study that has been done by Aaron Sen, our Bible worker. And uh, he's done this not, I forgot to look up exactly when he did it, but you know, he might be on here today even. So if he is good, he can help me. <laughs> but um, it was in the recent past, maybe two months ago or something, or a month ago, I think it was in May. I could be wrong about that. And he was doing it for what I understood to be people that were relatively new or just new in the message because he was starting at very basic um, understandings. And the last one that I did last month, I guess it was, was one of his first ones and it was on parable methodology. So this is like, it could be the next one he did, but. It, I think he might have done one in between. In any event, uh, these studies are not geared to necessarily break new ground or uh, catch the movement up to exactly where they are um, with uh, the presentations that are going out. His presentations are basically, the way I understand it, designed to give uh, the messages to who's coming next. And who's coming next, which we understand is right around the corner, are the Levites. So basically, I'm calling on all of you to uh, pretend like you're Levites today. You'll probably know a lot of this information, and um, that's good, because you may be called upon to share it. So as I went through it, I, uh, it was a subject that I, I kind of wanted to get more grounded in because it's um, talking about um, why, part of it is anyways, why Ellen White says that God could have already come. Uh, and that was in her time. She's writing these things. So the title of this one is called Daniel 11, 40 to 45, Uriah Smith versus Parable Methodology. So I'm going to be using the board, and hopefully you'll be able to see all this. Daniel. Eleven. 40 to 45, Uriah Smith, versus parable, whoops, not parable, Methodology. That's no, terrible. Oh, 
Okay. So, previously in our studies, we've drawn lines. And we've discovered, looking at the lines, that Jesus was meant to come in Alan White's time. But they failed and Jesus didn't come. And that would have been in the 1888 time frame or dispensation. So since Jesus doesn't come then uh, in 1888, what does God have to do? Well, he has to gather a new people to finish the work. So he could have come in 1888. Anybody see that? Hello? Yes. Okay, just checking. Um, so he doesn't come, and there's going to be a new people that have to be raised up. Now, Ellen White in uh, 1899 writes something that's very important for us to figure out what we're doing. And she says, and this is from President Truth, uh, June 29th, 1899, actually paragraph 11. She says that the first and the second angel's messages have to be repeated in the future. So in 1899, we're a little bit past 1888. And she says, this is going to be something in the future. So I'm going to write that up on the board here. Present truth. Uh, 629-1899. And this is the first and the second angels messages repeat okay hopefully you can see that okay um. all right so um now it's our turn because it's going to be a repeat to experience this first and second angels messages for ourselves and why do we need to do that because we have to give the loud cry of the third angel's message. And um, we saw how all these messages in the past, the first and second and third, were linked to events. So now they had their events um, with the first and second and third angel's message. So now it's our time, our turn to experience events under our first and second angels messages. Um, we just can't read about their experience in that time period and call it good. We have to have our own experience in these messages. Now the first way mark on every reform line is called the, starts with T, time of the end. Um, so our line, the line of the 144,000, will look something like this. Okay, so we have the time of the end to start with. And we're the 144,000. So um, these events were um, given to us by Ellen White in the Great Controversy, but not all of the events. So she gives us the time of the end. She tells us that that's 1798. And for our time, we're going to have to reinterpret that. But she does give us the, the name, the time of the end. 
and she does give us the middle way mark, which is the Sunday law. She does give us the uh, close of probation. And she does give us the second advent. What's that? Oops, that's not exactly what I mean. Let me see that. Okay. So she gives us these and um, in the great controversy. So we know that we're on solid ground as to where this timeline is going and, and how we get there. What has she done? What she does not give us is what ours in the 144,000 here is, what is our first and second angels messages? Because she says they're going to be need to be repeated. So we have to do what? We have to discover those ourselves. And how are we going to discover those? Through parable methodology. Okay. So let me put in our first and second angels message here. First and our second. Angels messages. Okay. And like I said, she's <clears throat> going to expect us to discover it on our own. Okay. So we know that the time of the end is always in. Uh, every generation. Why? Because it's the time of the end or the end times for that generation. And there are other lines that we could do that we could just take the line of Israel or ancient Israel. We could take the line of Elisha or Noah or Millerites or a lot of different lines, but they all start with the time of the end because that's the end of the time frame or time period, how it starts for their time. Okay, so in order to find out what the time of the end is, what do we need to do? Well, what we need to do is we need to look in our Bibles and search for that phrase, the time of the end. Okay, so where in the Bible is the time of the end phrase written? Uh, coincidentally, it's written seven times, and it's all in the book of Daniel. Now, for the purposes of this study, we're going to be looking at just Daniel 1140, where we find the phrase, time of the end. Um, so, we know in... Uh, Daniel 1140, that the time of the end is 1798, but we're going to borrow that phrase and make application to our first angel's message because the original tent of Daniel 1140 is the time of the end and it's their first angel's message. Okay, so let's, and their meaning uh, the Millerites. So we're going to draw a little Millerite line here. nice and straight. So they have their time of the end. And theirs was at 1798. We'll mark that the Millerite time period. Okay. So their first angel's message is marked at where? 1798. So we're going to mark our first angel's message for them at 1798. Also, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare or parallel. This is one of the methodologies. It's compare and contrast. We're going to parallel the first angel's message of the Millerite time with the first angel's message of our time. That way we can, can discover what? 
an event. We talked about that earlier. These are the first and second and third angels' messages are tied to events, and we're going to look for a date. Okay, so Uriah Smith here, he wrote a book, a famous book for Adventism, and it's called Daniel and the Revelation. And in uh, Manuscript 76, Ellen White in 1901 says something very important about this book. What she says is that I know of no other book that can take the place of this one. It's God's helping hand. So we're going to mark up here manuscripts 76. And when was it written? 1901. 1901. And what is it? It's God's helping hand. Only three fingers there. Oh, get right. <laughs> okay, we'll make it. There's clean. room. See the hand there? That's just to remind us that God is in the mix already here, as if we didn't know it. And he's directing Uriah Smith to write a very important book to help people understand Daniel 11. So, um, if Jesus would have come in, in Smith, Uriah Smith's dispensation or time period, this 1818 time period, 1888 time period, his interpretation would have been 100% correct. All right, so he first publishes the book in 1882, um, and that book, as already described, was Daniel Revelation. And Ellen White, as we saw, God's helping hand, that she recommends or endorses it for what? For her time. And she endorses it very strongly for her time. So I'm going to write on here where this is, 1882, Daniel and Revelation. So we see a timeline here of what's going on in the Millwright time period here. This is not staying on so good. Um, let's see. Oh, here we are. Now, Jesus didn't come back then. So how do we know that? Obviously, we're not in heaven. But Ellen White tells us that he could have come back. So how do we know that? Well, we're going to look at a couple of quotes uh, showing that he could have come back in that dispensation. And the first quote is from Desire of Ages, well-known book. And that is page 633.3. Uh, and when did she write that? Well, she wrote that one in 1898. Okay, so what did she say? She said, um, Had the Church of Christ done her appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would have been warned, and the Lord Jesus would have come to earth in power and great glory. Okay, so she's saying what? That he would have come back in 1898 had the, um, the church done her appointed work. So that's our first quote that talks about could have Christ, that Christ could have come back then. So in 1888, what was occurring in the United States externally? 
that we might understand what's going on. Well, what that was is they were attempting to create or put in a Sunday law. So they were trying to pass that. And we know they were trying to pass a Sunday law in 1888. So what is our next quote that talks about if Christ could have come back? And the next quote comes from Six Testimonies 449.4. So 6T. Four, four, nine point four. And when was that written? It was in uh, nineteen hundred. Okay. So finally, <laughs> our last quote talking about. Jesus could have come in the past already, is from General Conference Bulletin, March 30, 1903. So General Conference Bulletin, GCB, March 30, 1903. Okay, so let's mark that on our line here. First, we had the 6T in uh, 1900. And then we have the General Conference Bulletin in 1903. G, C, B, and the General Conference Bulletin says the following. I know if the people of God would have preserved the living connection with him, they would have obeyed his word. They would be in the heavenly Canaan. So you can see what she's saying. They would have been in heaven using the word heavenly Canaan. Now, what's interesting a little bit here is her language, because her language says Canaan. So what is that? She says a heavenly Canaan, but literally it's talking about how the Israelites were going into Canaan. And that was after the 40 years of wandering around in the desert. Actually, they could have gone in sooner. So the literal time was yeah, in ancient Israel, wanderings with Moses. And the spiritual time, she's saying, would be the heavenly Canaan. So she's already comparing and contrasting two different going into Canaan's. She's renaming the heavenly Canaan. So Joshua and Caleb were the literal, and in 1888, there was two people that were trying to get the church into the heavenly Canaan, and those two people were, does anybody know, shouted out, Jones and Wagner. Wagner. Right, very good, thank you, Bob. So um, you can see that Ellen White is giving us little glimpses of what we're doing right here now. She was doing. We're looking at different lines and comparing them <clears throat> uh, literally and spiritually, which is what? Terrible methodology. These things aren't new. We're just rediscovering them and, and our eyes are being opened up to a wider field of, a way wider field of understanding what's going on. Okay, so we know that Jesus was meant to come back in this dispensation here, and we have three quotes that are showing it or proving it, all from Ellen White. And uh, <clears throat> if Jesus would have come back in this time period, we know that Uriah Smith's book would be what? 100% correct. 
Okay, so even though we talk about Uriah Smith's book, um, who was he getting uh, a lot of his information or most of his information from? Well, it was from another famous man a little bit sooner than him, and that was Josiah Litch, his work. And he wrote his interpretation in 1840 work, 1840 work in his interpretation in 1841. And he wrote a book that was called uh, An Address to the Public and Especially the Clergy. An Address to the Public and Especially the Clergy, a long title for a book. And we abbreviate APEC. And especially on pages uh, 95 through 103. So I'm going to put that up here on the board. Uriah Smith, I mean, Josiah Litch. J O S A H Litch. Okay, so his book is in 1841, Oops. and it's APEC, pages 95 through 103, are the important ones. Now, This is an important guy, as we'll talk shortly about. In fact, he's important enough for Ellen to put in one of her most famous Adventist books, The Great Controversy. So in Great Controversy, uh, page 334.4, um, he's, he's talked about in there. And what is he talking about? What's the subject is? Say, what does she say about him? Yeah, what is she saying about him? And she's saying that um, he has a correct prediction about August 11, 1840. And that's when the Ottoman Empire was um, overthrown. She says, Litch was the messenger who empowered the first angel's message. Now, she doesn't exactly say it. I couldn't find it in that exact language, but it's inferred there in Great Controversy 335.1. Okay, so he predicts this uh, August 11, 1840, and what he's really doing here is He's putting forth a methodology, a proof of a methodology that um, helps William Miller. And that method is a day for a year. Okay, so who's giving the first angel's message at this time? Mr. Miller's giving the message at this time, the first angel's message. And uh, so in 1833 uh, is when he actually starts to give his, uh, we'll mark it on here, his first angel's message, 1833. Okay, I'm gonna move that over a little bit. Okay. Um, so Miller's giving his first angel's message, 1833, and Litch was giving his message around 1840. Um, what was this Litch's message actually doing? So in 1840, and here's Litch's message.
And what is his message actually doing? Well, it's confirming Mr. Miller's message. So Ellen White says that there was a great impotence added to the movement. So we can see that Josiah Lidge was the second messenger. So Miller's giving his message about the end of the world. And Lidge comes along and says, this day for the year um, principle methodology is going to show that Miller knows what he's talking about here. And I'm going to predict this. And when I predict this and it comes true, we're going to have proof of this. And when he actually does this, then the world stands up and starts taking notice of this uh, little farmer preacher, Mr. Miller. So um, it's not just, uh, okay, so you can see that Lich's was the second messenger. So let's write that down here. That Lich here, here's, he's the second messenger now. Okay, it's not just Smith's interpretation that we have confidence in because he writes this book, Daniel and Revelation. Um, it's the interpretation actually of the second messenger, Josiah Litch. And just for Josiah Litch to um, come up with this prediction in the Bible and show that it's true, putting himself out there and predicting it for the whole world to see that he's, he's making this prediction and then it comes true, we can see plainly that God is working with Josiah Litch. God has chosen him to be the person to back up Miller and say, hey, listen to what this guy's got to say here. And we're talking about the end of the world. So people are really getting uh, incited and trying to uh, move into this movement. So Litch wrote his interpretation in eight, uh, of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 in 1844. And, and that was the same year that God was using it. So Smith's interpretation of Daniel 11.45 is actually Litch. It's from the second messenger, um, uh, which God had chosen. So we know that God is choosing these men because he's got a purpose in mind here. And we should have a lot of confidence in S Smith. As we saw over there, Ellen White says that his book is God's helping hand. Okay, the book, Daniel and Revelation, on page 236, um, Uriah Smith, he explains the rule of who is the king of the north and who is the king of the south. All right? It basically says that any power with the territory north of Palestine or Israel is the king of the north. And any... Um, power or king that has control of the territory south of Palestine or Israel is the king of the south. Um, so where does Smith get this from? I mean, is he making this up? We know that, you know, God is in the mix here, but we need to kind of know, like, where does it come from? Let's find out. So where it actually comes from is from a verse in the Bible. And the verse in the Bible is Daniel 8.8. 8. And Daniel 8.8 8 is talking about the four winds. And that would be the north, south, east, west. And this comes from, in Daniel 8.8, 8, talking about the Grecian Empire that was being broken up. Alexander the Great's empire was broken up into four different generals eventually. And uh, this is where the four winds was coming from. So one of the ways we can see that winds is the four points of the compass is by looking at Dan uh, Revelation 7.1. Four winds is mentioned there, but it's something is added to that. 
when the four winds are mentioned, and that is the uh, four corners of the earth. So the earth is a globe, it's round. So it doesn't exactly have corners, but if you were to take a globe and cut it and split it and lay it out flat, easily to find north and south, and then you would just add east and west on there. So you can see that the four corners of Revelation 7-1 really talks, and they're described as the four winds, talks about the four different directions. Okay, so um, north and south of what? Well, we said Palestine, okay? I'm going to draw a little map here in just a minute. So as time goes on, there's wars and there's kings and there's overthrow of lands and territories. And eventually we come down to just two. And that's the king of the north and the king of the south. They're the only ones remaining. And what is all of this that Smith is talking about? What methodology is he using there? Well, he's using literal because they're literally in the north of Israel and they're literally in the south. So that would be the literal or the natural uh, methodology. So going back for just a second to Alexander the Great and why Israel is the focal point that they're calling the north and the south from the east and the west. Well, because we know in Daniel 8.8 8, that uh, this is what it was. It was the four kingdoms that were broken up. Well, as you look at um, the Grecian Empire, uh, Alexander the Great is conquered. He's conquered way up by Greece. Then he's down here in the Middle East. And then he goes down to Egypt and he's over there running around over in Babylon and a lot of countries down in this way, if you can imagine where I'm pointing. But between Greece up in here and these countries down in here, what's in the middle? The middle is Israel. And it's not only like in the middle kind of geographically, but if you're going to go from Greece to, let's just say, Egypt or wherever you're going to go down this way, Babylon or something, generally the route is taken through uh, Israel. That's the best route to take. And that's where all the armies were going through. This is one of the reasons why there's so much fighting, there still is, fighting going on in Israel because it's a very important uh, area, thoroughfare, you might say. Okay, so where am I? Um, Let's see, like a messenger. Okay, yeah. So let's look at a little map here. I'm gonna draw a map so we can look at things a little more uh, easier and talk about it slightly. So this map here is gonna go like this and it's gonna turn up here like this and then it's gonna kind of go out here like that and it's gonna come on down and then it's gonna come up here and it's gonna look like something like that. And connect there. And then this is gonna come down here. So what we have here is a map of the Middle East, even though it doesn't look like it. And this is Israel. Right here. Okay. Now, um, so when we read about the king of the north and the king of the south, let's come down to that. Which country literally is the king of the north in Bible times? So we're looking back biblically and we're going to try and identify who the king of the north and the king of the south is. So uh, the king of the north would be Babylon. Okay. 
Okay, so that's the king of the north. Now, if you're looking on this map here, there's a famous town in Babylon, and it's called Babylon. And it's approximately, I'm not perfect here, about right in here, let's just say. So how is it that the king of the north, and this is north, that's south, this is east, this is west. East is over here, and Israel's over here. It doesn't seem like Babylon is really the king of the north. It seems like it's kind of the king of the east. So how do we figure that out? Does anybody have any ideas? Don't be shy. It was the uh, the route that Babylon would travel to get to Israel, so they would come from the north. Very good, Richard. Thank you. So Richard says they're coming from the north. So if you're in Israel and you see these people coming from the north, you're going to say that's where they are. But why did they come from the north? I mean. Why didn't they just go straight over from where they were and instead they take this longer route and come around? Well, in every time, but let's just say in Bible times, because we're looking at this literally, there's a reason why they went that way. And the reason is called water. Every army gets thirsty. Their horses, their camels, whatever they have, has to have water. And between here and Israel, Babylon and Israel, there's no water out there. This is flat desert. But this going up here like this is the Euphrates River. And it goes up quite a long ways. And so they follow along the river. And as they get all the way along the river, there's some other spots up here that they can get water. There's some smaller rivers. And so they follow the river all the way up until they get to the point where they can come down. And that's when they're coming from the king of the north. Following the rivers. Okay, so now that we've discovered that Babylon is the king of the north, we need to find out who's the king of the south. So literally, on this map, who would be the king of the south? Who's south of Israel? Egypt. Anyone? Egypt. Egypt. Okay, thank you. E G. Y P T, and they're the king of the south. Okay, now we've identified those two uh, entities. Um, so in Daniel eleven, Uriah Smith interprets this whole entire chapter. I mean, he does more than that, but. In Daniel 11, there's, uh, there's a time when Babylon is replaced. And who is it that replaces Babylon? Everybody knows this. Persia. Who, who is it that destroys Babylon? Remember the statue in Daniel 2. Who is it that takes over uh, Babylon? The power of Babylon. Persia. 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 Okay. Thank you, Linda. And then Meta Persia is taken over by who? Greek. Greece. Greek. Very good, Carol. And after Greece comes Rome. 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 Very good. And then according to Smith, who does he say takes over after that? Turkey. Turkey, I heard in the audience here. Okay, so we're going to draw a little timeline of that to show a little something here. So this is Daniel 11. Basically the whole chapter. Nice straight timeline. And in Daniel 11, it starts out with Babylon, right? Mm -hmm. No. It starts out with Medo-Persia. You might want to look that up. Mm -hmm. So Medo-Persia is here. I'm just going to abbreviate Medo-Persia. 
And then a little farther down, we get Greece. Greece, C, and that's it. And Greece is taken over by Rome. And then Uriah Smith says, finally, you get Turkey. All right. Now, what are all of these four entities? And we'll call Turkey. We'll just add Turkey in there, according to Smith. They're the king of uh, what? South, east, west. What are these all kings of? North. Kings of the north. Thank you. Is that Alyssa? Who is that? Anyways, Mary. Oh, hi, Mary. Um, who are they fighting against? So they're fighting against the king of the south. And these are battles that go against Egypt for one way or the other. We see that Medo Persia had fought against Egypt, Greece had fought against Egypt, Rome had fought against Egypt, Egypt, and down here at the end, Turkey. Smith is predicting in Daniel 11:45 that he's going to be fighting there. So these are all fighting against Egypt. Egypt, 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 Egypt. King of the North fighting against the King of the South. Okay. Now, when you draw this whole line out here and it goes through history, what do we finally end up with? It takes you down to the final end of everything, and that would be the close of probation and the second advent. Right here. So Turkey's right just before that. Because when you read this whole uh, interpretation of Smith, and when you read it in the Bible, you see that you end up with verse 45, and then what is the next verse? Daniel 12, 1, which Kathy told me is when Daniel 12, 1 is when Michael stands up. Okay, now we've already shown uh, how the, uh, by these three quotes here, how the second advent could have already come, but they failed. So, which means what? That means that the end time events that were predicted by Smith and Turkey failed. We're going to have to have something different happen. So, these events here. Turkey was suited for what? This time frame, Daniel or uh, Uriah Smith's book. So that time frame, uh, the 181888 era, and now we're looking at what, where we are. So in 1888, or just say 1798, 1840, the world, we could all agree, was a very different place than it is now. So we're going to have to reinterpret these verses from Turkey onward because it's failed. Um, and how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to reinterpret them with parable methodology uh, or symbolically. We're going to have to look at the king of the north and the king of the south symbolically. So you remember that's part of parable methodology is the literal and the symbolic. Um, okay, an example why Smith interpretation, interpretations would not work today. Litch says that all the verses, all the way up to 
uh, verse 45 have been fulfilled except for verse 45. It hadn't been fulfilled. And he says that Turkey has to do something. It needs to, in verse 45, it uses the words tabernacle, which are tents. It needs to plant, and Turkey would be up in here. Let's just put a T up here somewhere. Turkey. It's going to have to plant its tabernacle or war tents in where? Palestine or Israel. Um, now, people that are holding to Uriah Smith's book still have been waiting for 180, almost 200 years for this to happen. And it hasn't happened yet. So they're watching the news. And they're waiting for Turkey to start a war with Israel and go plant their war tents. That's what it says the tabernacles are in verse 45 in Israel. Now, if Turkey would have put her war tents in Israel, what would we know? Where would we know we were then? Well, we would know that we were in the next verse, which we talked about, which was right here. And that is the close of probation. So they're looking for this to happen, but it's not gonna happen. And there's reasons why it can't happen, okay? In fact, it's impossible to happen. Let's just put it that way. That is the literal interpretation of Turkey can happen. Okay, first, if you try to say Smith's interpretation uh, will happen, you have to use the way he's, uh, what um, methodology, he, methodology that he uses, and he's using literal methodology. And um, we know that that's had failed. So what we would have to see was Turkey had come down and they'd have to invade Israel, topple the government, wipe them out, and start erecting their tabernacles in, say, Jerusalem or Israel. So this is not going to happen. And why is this not going to happen? I mean, this is a little country. Turkey's a big country, and Turkey might get people helping it. That seems like, well, could that happen? No, there's a big reason why it couldn't happen. And the reason... I'm not a very good artist, but I'm going to draw something that you might guess what this is. Okay. Does anybody know what that might look like? It's small, I know. It's a bomb. Um, okay. So um, it's not exactly the kind of bomb that Israel has, but that's just a, a little representation. It's a parable, my wife says. So Turkey knows what? That Israel has nuclear warheads. And how many does Turkey have? Turkey has this many. If you take your thumb and your middle finger and you bring them closely together like that, you'll see that it's a zero. That's how many Turkey has. They have no nuclear weapons. Israel is loaded up. So. It's not a really wise idea, and they know that, to go down there and start messing around and try and take the country over. So here's what Wikipedia says as far as what's the balance of power is. Uh, it's estimated, Wikipedia again, that the stockpile of Israel's ranges from 80 to 400 nuclear weapons. And they have the ability to, to uh, fly over with aircraft, drop a bomb. They can use a submarine anywhere, I guess, located and shoot off a missile from there. Or they have this thing called the Jericho series of intermediate to intercontinental range ballistic missiles. So there's a, a number of ways that Israel can wipe out whoever they actually want to. Um, 
So Turkey knows all this and they wouldn't try to invade. Now, let's just say that there was a crazy guy up there and he's, he's gonna try and invade anyways, okay? So he starts coming down and he starts getting into Israel and Israel's trying to stop him without using nuclear weapons. They get their tanks and their jets out and they're having a big war here. Well, maybe it looks like all of a sudden that maybe Turkey's gonna take over Israel. So what does Israel have to do? Well, all they have to do is push a little button, so to speak. And this button would launch a nuclear weapon, missile up to Turkey in probably less than 10 minutes, Turkey's gonna be wiped out and they're gonna be completely unable to uh, take over Israel. So we see that this is impossible for uh, Urias and his interpretation to take place in the world that we know and that we're living in right now. So if that's impossible, how are we gonna find out these end time scenarios? We're gonna to have to reinterpret these end time uh, events by parable methodology. So uh, we reread these verses and interpret them symbolically instead of literally. And so the wars between the king of the north and the king of the south that we're now looking at are not going to be literal wars. They're going to be ideological wars, ideological wars, which are fought by, and we know this in the movement, by information. So they will be informational war, warfare that's going on. Okay. So today we've explained why we use parable methodology to reinterpret Daniel 11, 40, 45. And why do we do that? Because Smith's literal or the natural has failed. Um, and because basically as they, the Millerites went through their first and second angels messages, these events in Smith's interpretation work for what? His time period. So this Daniel and Revelation, God's helping hand, work for his time period. And since they failed, we're gonna have to start over again and find out what our first and second angels message. So we have to go back to verse 40, reinterpret the verses for our modern world today. So, Here's the question. What is our first angel's message? What is our second angel's message? And who is the king of the north in our day? And who is the king of the south in our day today? And we're gonna be looking at those symbolically if we're gonna find a right interpretation of uh, the end time scenario, end time events before Christ is to come. Okay, so remember that in 1899, Ellen White tells us what? That the second, the first and second angels' messages are gonna to have to be repeated, as we saw here. And now we're living in that time that they're gonna be have to be repeated. We're in the future. We're no longer running through this line anymore. We've got our own line and we got the end of the world that's fast approaching. So we're gonna to have to repeat and reset these final uh, events. All right. So quickly reviewing, we're coming to the close. We have the three quotes that Ellen White says, what? That Christ could have come back, but he didn't come back in their time period here. So we're going to have to repeat the first and second angel's message. And we saw that Uriah Smith's Daniel Reverend's 40, Revelation 40 to 45 um, were uh, Turkey comes at the end of time, the end of the line here was a failure. So we're going to have to symbolically reinterpret 
uh, verse 45 for our time and understand what our first and second angel's messages are by parable methodology. Okay, so that was the study that I uh, repeated from Aaron. And so with that, I'll ask if anybody has any questions or comments or concerns to uh, speak up. Say, hey, David. Yes. What is the page number for uh, present truth, uh, the present truth quote that you have and the, and the manuscript 76? Okay, so the present truth is simply the present truth. And I think it was a magazine. I could be wrong about that. And it came out on June 29th, 1899. But you would look down for paragraph 11. Okay, so it's okay. that's the reference right there. And what was the other one? I'm sorry, Jim. And uh, uh, manuscript 76 page number. I, I don't know if it's written there or I can't read it. <laughs> uh, it's, let me see if I can find it. I just manuscripts so all of them. Yeah, I don't think that. Manuscript 76. Manuscript 76. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. I don't see anything besides that. It's just that that's the, uh, that's the reference. So this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this study is because I really wanted to uh, have this stuck in my mind about why, you know, and where Ellen White actually says all these things that it could have happened. And since it didn't happen, what really happened? And why, why are we uh, still here on earth? So that's kind of what this study was for. When I saw Aaron doing it, I, I said, oh, I like this. He has a number of studies that are really basic for getting us kicked off on kind of the groundwork of our movement. Okay. So I thank you for your time and your attention. And if there's no other comments. I just wanted to say thank you, Brother Dave. Uh -huh. Thank you, David. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you. And it's going to be hard to break that brother and sister thing. I yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do it. Yes. Yeah, we can do it. I remember I worked at a hospital for years and years, and we changed the name of the hospital in the middle of, you know, all these years of working there. And it took a long time for me to change what I was doing. But by God's grace, we'll get there. Amen. Amen. Okay. Could you take a picture of the board and, and, and uh, publish it so we can see it better? Your notes. Yes, I can do that. Um, I also I have my notes that I can. I like your notes. Send those. Uh, I I I'm not sure if I can put those on the Lambert Church chat. We'll be able to do it. But we'll get it somehow. You just keep looking for it because then you'll have all the a couple screenshots and the quotes and that sort of stuff for you. Okay. And it's you, not Dad. exactly. Worth, you're welcome. It's not exactly word for word from Aaron, but it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. That was great. It was wonderful. <laughs> oh, praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah, we enjoyed it too. I enjoyed it too. And um, actually, if you send your notes to Pam, she'll send them out. She did for me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank oh. you, Dave. That was really good presentation. Yes, yeah. uh, yeah, thank you, Brother David. So thank you, David. Welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome, Richard. It's just like the Willis Tower in Chicago. I still call it the Sears Tower. Thank you. Okay, well, let's close in prayer.
Father in heaven, I thank you for another Sabbath day. And I thank you, Lord, for helping me through this study. I pray it can be effective for us as we uh, work with the Levites soon, Lord, to help them to see that uh, you didn't come and things have to be reinterpreted. And it's all going to be a work of faith on their parts to come on to this parable methodology. So I ask ahead of time, Lord, that you work with all the Levites and ready them for this, Lord. So we praise you and thank you for being a part of this and just ask that your spirit would guide us not only the rest of the day, but clear to heaven. So we thank you and praise you and we pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Very good. Amen. Thank you, um, Brother David. I have a quick announcement, if that's okay, Sister Pam. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to remind everyone that once you log on, if you if you don't have a picture, a profile picture, if you could please put your um, first and last name, or at least your first name, um, to associate exactly who you are. Um, and we want to uh, thank you all again for joining us this Sabbath. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. God bless you, everyone. God bless, Pam. Mm -hmm. Thank you. God bless. Love you guys. Yeah, I love you guys. Love everybody. Love, love you. you. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.